Texted yeah. me and said, you know, she didn't do so, or she was going to lay back, you know, and so, you know, like, you know, like 10 oh, hours sure. here. He said, there's some forms, and so we you know, need to charge, but he said, if I can bring a box, I think that's sort of the bleacher room. Yeah, you know, 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 you in my class, we have to One of my favorite shows growing up, I don't know how real it is compared to the professional. Quincy. But as far as the science and the medicine, I'll take it. There's like, there was a lot of truth to that. Hmm. There really was. The side of King Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. 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 I was looking at your I'm so sorry. I guess I'm pretty sure we would all change it. How about let's get it just in this I don't know about I can't say. Press P R E well, good evening, everyone. 
Welcome to the Mandarin Branch Library. Uh, my name is Lisa Bugs. I am the coordinator for lifelong learning for the Jacksonville Public Library System. Uh, I'm going to get some housekeeping out of the way. If you need to go to the restroom, it's out the door, to the left, and an immediate left. Um, if there is an emergency, look for me, the tall lady. And I will get us out here in a safe manner, even though we do have JFR and JSO in the house. I just want you guys to know that we usually have a plan. So uh, look, look for us and follow the directions of the people in the uniforms. Um, also, I just want to really thank you guys for coming out tonight. We know it's a weeknight. We know um, that everyone has had probably a long day at work. But we really appreciate you coming out to um, this really important discussion that we're having. I'd like to introduce to you our panelists. Um, on the very end, we have Dr. Peter Gillespie. He is an associate medical examiner for the medical examiner's office. We have Lieutenant Matt Rowley, Mark Rowley. He serves as the data and privacy officer for Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department and sits on the city of Jacksonville's opioid pilot project committee. Then next to him is Richard Preston. He is a recovering addict of 12 years. He's the author of two books on addiction, including Serenity Granite, and he is the owner of two sober living residences. Next to him is Ron, is it Lenvey? Lenvey. He's the director of investigation and Homeland Security for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. And rounding us out tonight is Tim Quick. He is the chief investigator for the state attorney's office. Please, a round of applause for our panel of experts. <laughs> so we're going to begin um, today's discussion with uh, a general sort of uh, layout. What types of drugs uh, does the term opiate cover? And uh, Tell us where these addicts are getting these drugs for those people who are on the panel who can answer that question. Um, I can answer the question about what kind of drugs they are. They vary from everything from pharmaceutical opioids, things like hydrocodone or oxycodone, and uh, pharmaceutical morphine, codeine, uh, hydromorphone, things like that to illicit uh, drugs such as uh, heroin. And um, now the big problem here in Jacksonville is a drug <coughs> called uh, fentanyl. It's a synthetic opiate. It's been around for several years, uh, but recently uh, clandestine chemists have been making variants of them called uh, analogs, which are much more powerful than fentanyl, which itself is probably estimated to be about 100 times more powerful than morphine. And they've been adding those to illicit drug preparations of all kinds, not just opiates. Uh, we're starting to see it in cocaine uh, cases, too. Uh, and those are the, um, the drugs involved, exactly where they're getting them. Uh, investigators might know better. Um, obviously, things like heroin and uh, uh, fentanyl analogs are illicit drugs. Other things are diverted into the black market from uh, pharmaceutical you know, sources, patients, and things like that. You, you know, might know better than I do about that. I'll take where they're coming from. <clears throat> you can buy drugs from any part of town, anywhere from within a stone's throw of uh, this library to uh, you know, the traditional, you know, more drug infested areas of town. And one of the things that's probably changed is the diversification of the product that they carry. You used to have a cocaine house or a marijuana house. Mm -hmm. Um, things like that. But as I know with our guys, the narcotics guys, when they do search warrants now, it's not at all uncommon to go to a traditional area that's sold cocaine and find also in there the diverted prescription pills that uh, the doctor was talking about mm -hmm. to find heroin, um, you know, just a, a smorgasbord. So if there is a, a profit to be made, a drug dealer is going to sell whatever he can get his hands on and he's going to be able to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are the two sides of it. There are the people who are purchasing the drugs and getting the high, and then there are the people who are profiting by selling. Right. And sometimes they're one and the same. Ah. Okay. Okay. So um, I know that one of the things that uh, we have here is something called Project Save Lives. And Mark, um, can you give us an overview of Project Save Lives? Yeah, so Project Save Lives is the City of Jacksonville's 
opioid pilot program uh, funded through uh, your tax dollars. Uh, $1.46 million was set aside and the program began November 16th of last year. And essentially, um, the, it meets the person who is suffering or experiencing an overdose at the ED. And traditionally, uh, when somebody is experiencing an overdose, and hopefully not one is called, or they are you know, driven by somebody to the ED, they are reversed and or resuscitated with a drug called naloxone or Narcan. And with that reversal, oftentimes they awake uh, very rapidly, and they will experience withdrawal symptoms, very painful. Uh, some uh, will reference it called dope sick, and they'll want to leave. They'll want, they'll want to, uh, they do not want to be in the ED. And the term that we use in our profession is treating and street. And that is not to be uh, derogatory or disparaging. It is simply that patients have rights. And they have rights to make bad decisions. Um, so what we're doing with Project Save Lives is as soon as that person gets the ED on our stretcher or through, you know, through being driven up, the, there, we have peer recovery specialists, people with lived experience in addiction, and recovery to speak that language of the heart, to let them know, I know where you're at. I know what you're going through, and we're gonna get you some help. And I'm gonna walk you through and navigate this with you. And they also act as advocates with the nurse and the physician to get them treatment for withdrawal symptoms. And, and when I say treatment for withdrawal symptoms, I'm talking as simple as back to the chronic being, you know, by mouth, assuming they're, they're conscious and awake, and within minutes, some of their symptoms resolve and they make them aware of a program. The goal is to get them to go immediately from the ED into residential treatment up to nine to 13 days through our program. If they decide, I don't wanna do residential, because many can't, they have barriers. If it's childcare, if it's work, if it's other situations, then we say, let's do outpatient therapy, and, or outpatient treatment, I should say. And we also offer the medication-assisted treatment uh, which includes induction of buprenorphine at the ED, immediate immediate stopping of withdrawal symptoms. And uh, if they elect to do the medication-assisted treatment, then they also have to agree immediately within 24 hours to go to the detox and treatment to have that followed. We also offer them detox based on their, uh, their withdrawal symptoms. Something that this project is doing that no other project in the United States is doing is we're combining everything. We're putting somebody there who can speak that language of compassion, address compassion fatigue, those sideways thoughts or comments from myself, the nurses, the staff, and the ED, and we are giving them wraparound services. We're also testing them in the ED, their urine for fentanyl. There is no, nowhere in the nation where we're currently doing uh, basically point of care urine uh, dipstick dipsticks for different fentanyl analogs. And as we learn about the different analogs, the Amy's office, Premier Biotech, will, will basically put that into their testing. Because of that, we have been able to track and, and show the different analogs that are here in Jacksonville. We've seen an alarming increase in persons that are on their recreational users of cocaine, that swear they're not touching opioids, but they're testing positive for fentanyl, and they're being reversed with Narcan. So uh, it's very dangerous, it's very scary right now that we're seeing possibly a change in the demographic. Um, but Project Save Lives is immediate intervention, wrap around 360 services, and we have uh, 69 uh, persons right now that are actually getting treatment through Project Save Lives. And some of that treatment, again, is inpatient, outpatient, they're followed, recovery care specialists, knocking the door, calling them, driving their home three days a week. And it may also include other things such as pulse step programs, church, a risk reduction, you know, not not using uh, uh, the fentanyl, but using something else. So it's it's a uh, it's very catered uh, services to the individual client. Okay. So we have you as a responder. We have JSO as a responder. We have the medical examiner's office that has to deal with you know uh, uh, one of the consequences of overdosing. Uh, we have a state attorney's office that deals with it from a, a different level. But let's talk to Richard. Richard, um, you're recovering, you have been for 12 years, uh, kudos to you, uh, 12 years. And tell us, what is it like being the individual who is addicted to uh, an opiate? Um, 
fortunately, uh, during my addiction, um, I wasn't addicted to opiates. Uh-huh. Uh, it wasn't big back in those days. I'm sure it was, or it was just uh-huh. uh, on the cusp. Uh, I was a cocaine user, uh-huh. uh, crack, uh, and alcohol. Uh, the one thing I can say, back in the back when I was uh, in my full addiction, uh, they used to tell us that crack was the most addictive substance known to man, or cocaine was. Uh-huh. Uh, but we all know that's not true with um, But to be held slave to uh, a substance, um, in my first book I talk about it, it is almost, um, it, it's hard to convey. Um, because, you know, I have parents, and loving parents, and my mom would be like a lot of parents in here, uh, just stop, or, you know, uh, take 30 days off, or this or that. Uh, only do it on the weekends. But to the person that has the disease of addiction, uh, it, it, it starts, it starts out as fun, it catches up with you, then it overwhelms you, and then you wake up one day and you just gotta have it, and you will uh, go exhaust any means to get it, and that's when you start coming in contact with the right. jokes right here. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, um, what happens, uh, Ron, when you get a call, when there's a 911 call that comes in, uh, how does JSO respond? JSO and JFRD, how do you guys respond when, when a call comes in? Well, many times we respond at the same time. It'll come in as a medical uh-huh. distress call. Uh-huh. <clears throat> your, your basic caller often can't diagnose exactly what's going on, so it'll come in as a medical emergency. Sometimes it'll be a suspected overdose. Uh-huh. Um, so we're often dispatched for these calls at the same point in time. Uh-huh. If for some reason it's a, it's a call that came out that didn't involve um, JFRD, you know, the police officer would go, if there's a medical um, need right at that point in time, that's going to be the first priority. So if we see someone who's in need of medical attention, the first call that's going to be made is to JFRD to come out and assist, and if you know, CPR is needed or anything else, that's going to, that's going to get started. Um, you know, if, if there's a whole if there's a criminal incident involved, then they're going to deal with the criminal incident, make sure, make sure everything's stable and safe, okay. then they'll assess the person's medical needs for medical. Okay. All right, so what's the first thing JFRD does? What's you get on the scene? The, the, uh, and just to second what everybody may say, the primary service agent, one of the primary 911 center is Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, and they simultaneously relay the call. Oftentimes, their officer stays on the phone with our dispatcher okay. and call taker. Uh, to ascertain what's going on, to maybe get a uh, location, things like that. So we work very well together uh, as far as our communication centers. And uh, once we arrive on scene, aside from scene safety and, and making sure that we're not interfering with a potential crime scene, right. um, which, by the way, law enforcement has control of the scene you know, legally, so we, we really operate with them well. And uh, our first, our, outside of our own personal safety, is airway, the safety of the patient and getting your breathing. The, the primary uh, symptom um, is you know, decreased responsiveness and knocks out the breathing. That, that's the concern we have for opioids. And I'm pleased and, and correct for wrong, uh, director, but every JSO recruit, I mean, out before they hit the street, they're trained in CPR. Absolutely. And so that they can manage airway. Okay. Um, and from JSO to JFR, we can all manage that airway. And so, and they also have ADDs in their vehicles. So we've had several lives saved uh, by JSO uh, prior to us getting here. So uh, we're, we work well together in that sense. But our primary uh, response is, of course, address their airway. As soon as we even believe it's an opioid on board, either through our own assessment of the patient and or what we see on the scene, or as evidenced by bystanders telling us what's going on, the obvious needle in the arm, the young man in the bathroom, and, you know, at, at a local gas station, these are telltale signs. And uh, we go ahead and administer Narcan on naloxone, IV or IM, and usually within, you know, one, two minutes, they're responding in a way, and we, we still provide them supportive care and transport them to the ED. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Gillespie, what effect does opiate use have on a human body, just in general, as a whole? What does it do? Well, in general, it, it, they, they do what they've been designed to do, the pharmaceutical ones, is they relieve people's pain and their pain symptoms, uh, but at the same time, they're powerful respiratory depressants, so they, uh, they're going to reduce your respiratory rate, uh, which if it gets low enough, is going to um, impact your brain, your heart, and your other oxygen-sensitive organs like your kidneys and liver a lot. 
but the respiratory part it really just shuts down uh, your breathing. So we know that from a physical standpoint, it's keeping us from <coughs> breathing. Let's talk about another aspect of this that uh, we don't usually think about because when you watch it on the news, it's mostly making sure that people get um, some sort of physical help immediately, but there is a legal aspect to opioid addiction. And Tim, if you could sort of uh, talk to us about the legal implications of people who are dealing in opiates. Fortunately for the state of Florida, the law changed in October. Uh, prior to that, fentanyl was not a substance that you could charge somebody uh, with contributing to a death. Oh, wow. Somebody died in the result of a fentanyl overdose. You could not charge that dealer with uh, causing that death. Okay. Uh, but fortunately for us, uh, federal law uh, allowed that. So prior to October 1st, we worked with JSO, we worked uh, specifically with Clay County okay. and uh, Jack Beach where the cause of death is fentanyl. So we took those cases to the federal uh, court in, in Jacksonville. We have currently have pending five cases with seven defendants, uh, we, and we was victims died of the only fentanyl. And after October 1st, that all changed. Now we can charge somebody to take Florida for the state statute with causing a death. To the now, are the folks who are being charged, have they also been selling other drugs? Like, are they also people who are selling cocaine or selling marijuana, or is it strictly the, the So, like what well, I mentioned earlier, the house, I think the one we did recently, they mm -hmm. gave a weapon of a, a weapon. Weapon. in the house. Uh -huh. I hit one with our guys prior to that. They sold the video, uh, knock and talk, and kick the door in for us. Mm -hmm. We did the, uh, the inventory, but powder cocaine, there was uh, heroin in there, mm -hmm. there was some crack in there, mm -hmm. firearms. I lost my cat. I think you all have that in the house too as well. So, so the other thing. And I think a lot of times we've seen this is the dealers think they're selling heroin, not knowing it's waste of fentanyl. One of the recent cases, I'll lose your case, Tom, that the dealer is adamant that he's only selling heroin. He, he swears he doesn't have fentanyl. Uh, but that's the only thing I've tested, they were pure fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times these dealers don't know what they're doing. They're selling poison. Or they were selling loaded guns is what they're doing to people. And uh, uh, we won't be better. It's a good segue into how that happens. So the reality is these synthetic fentanyls are being made in clandestine laboratories, typically in other countries, China, Mexico, and it's coming through traditional drug routes here. <clears throat> but the reality is it's much cheaper than the heroin is. So every time that shipment changes hands from the original trafficker to the next level dealer, everybody's mixing in a little fentanyl because it's increasing their profit margin. So if that, you know, by the time it gets down to the dealer, like uh, Mr. Quick's speaking about, you may have had three or four different levels of dealers that mixed in fentanyl to increase the amount of heroin they had that they could cut and sell. So that potency with the fentanyl is getting higher and higher because it's a profit trail. If I could add to the yes. danger for law enforcement, a lot of the guys, our guys, are out there buying this stuff. Uh, they, they just take a small amount of fentanyl uh, to, to absorb through your, through your fingertips or to your meal. And it's deadly for the, the law enforcement as well. And we don't always know what we're coming in contact with. Uh, it's dangerous all the way around. Yeah, we, we had a policy change recently in regards to that. We did some research with some labs, and we actually have a in our property evidence room, we don't field test powdered substances at all on the field now. It's just too too dangerous either to get them, open them in a, in a vehicle where it can be in the circulation system or if you're out and you're testing something on the hood of the car and the breeze comes by, getting that into your respiratory system can be instantly, you know, dramatic for you. So our powdered substances, if they're going to be tested, there's a rest involved a field testing environment. You go to our property and evidence room, we actually have a glass room built that does not have air from the top, it has a vent hood in there. So everything's done under glass, um, you know, wearing full protective measures, you know, to make sure that they don't get, get an exposure. But we've seen it around the country where officers have been exposed, you know, doing typical drug work, drug warrants, that type of thing, where they've been exposed to fentanyl. It becomes airborne, the suspect tries to knock over the table where his drugs are, or you know, through an entry into a room, something that's turned over that becomes airborne. And there's been you know, a number of cases where numbers of officers have been sick and have been hospitalized. Wow. Um, Dr. Gillespie, how has the epidemic in Jacksonville affected your work in the medical examiner's office? 
Um, well, it's uh, it's increased our workload uh, quite a bit. I was just looking at the numbers here, um, just for the um, the first six months of last year. We don't have this year's numbers, but in, in those first six months, we had almost 150 cases of deaths involving fentanyl, just fentanyl, and that's a tremendous amount. Um, it, if you look at the whole year's cases, we're doing almost 3,000 autopsies a year, and that's about 5% voluntarily. That's a tremendous amount with just fentanyl. So um, there are days where we've had nothing but uh, drug intoxications. Uh, it's gone down a little bit. It seems to have spiked around early to mid-2017, and it's come down a little. But now, as the gentleman said, we're starting to see mixed cocaine, fentanyl uh, cases, things like this. So. It's really just put a tremendous amount of pressure on our available resources. I mean, it's, it's hard to, to get them all done sometimes. In 2016, Jacksonville ranked number two. Uh, this is the Emmys, the state Emmy data, but number two in fentanyl deaths, just under uh, West Palm Beach, Miami. Wow. Second to Miami only. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Think about that. We are second to Miami. Um, so the public has expressed an interest and in, is it, how do you pronounce this? Naloxone? Naloxone. And there are some libraries in other parts of the country um, that keep the drug in stock uh, because we've had people who have overdosed in libraries. Um, do you recommend that folks try to get a hold of this, uh, especially if they have a loved one? who they know is probably experiencing um, addiction with opioids? So, absolutely. So anybody, especially people, uh, loved ones, friends, family, the person themselves that are suffering from addiction, uh, to carry it. Uh, equate it with an EpiPen. If anybody you know, has an allergy and has an EpiPen, uh, it's very important that other people know where your EpiPen is in the workplace. You know, it's, it's not good when you're at work and it's in the glove box after a via in parking garage. So, um, in, in that same fashion, uh, if you have them, you have, everybody now has access to nasal naloxone or Narcan. So, uh, the governor signed a bill, uh, actually almost two years ago, they also um, changed the Good Samaritan Act law to incorporate identification and protection for every single person in this room, all right, to administer Narcan for a suspected overdose. So, you don't need to be a doctor, you don't need to be a paramedic, you, you just... If they're not responsive or you suspect it, Narcan is that safe. You know, you, you, you put them on the side, you give a, a shot up the nose, call 911. If they don't respond, give them the other the other dose. And it is free. So last week I purchased it uh, at the Walgreens. I, I carry it in my, my private vehicle as well as my city vehicle. Um, and uh, again, Walgreens is, it takes about five minutes to fill out a form it's free. So you don't even, they didn't ask for my health insurance. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and the, I would recommend essentially anybody because in, in my profession we're about saving lives, you know, and and, and, and we're very limited in our, in our scope as far as in the, the whole uh, big picture of addiction. However, there is concern about false sense of security. Naloxone or Narcan is a reversal agent. It takes that opioid off the receptor site, pushes it off because it has a, a, a tighter affinity or it, it binds better, if you will, than most opioids. But as, as everybody here will tell you, that, that next analog that's cooked up mm -hmm. may be stronger and it may bind tighter, meaning the Narcan may not work as well. So the concern, as I want everybody to know, is that Narcan is not is a temporary reversal agent. Its half-life and its therapeutic value in your body is 30 to 81 minutes. That's what the National Institute of Health says. Well, let's hope your liver's working while your kidneys. But, you know, everybody's body is different. So maybe I've only got 30 minutes. The next person has an hour. Don't gamble. You still need to call 911. And so if they administer Narcan, they need to call 911. Even if the victim wakes up and says, I don't want it. Don't call them. They leave. The, uh, don't let them in the house. If it's your loved one, let us in. Let us talk to them. You know, we're not, we, we want to get them help. And it will wear off. And we're finding because of these these analogs are so strong, we're looking at Narcan drips. Even some ERs have nasal uh, atomized Narcan, put them on low dosage because the drugs are so strong. So uh, 
while I am a strong advocate for it being carried, we must call 911 because it will wear off. And, and I don't know if Director Libe, I've heard of these black word Lazarus parties or where, you know, uh, Narcan parties where one person is carrying an Narcan and they switch off. And I don't know if you're able to speak to that. But. Well, the email came out recently. I think it was uh, P and F. Uh, Chunk out the uh, the email around, but they have our camp party. Our camp, no, I saw the our camp party. But one person is responsible for the kick, and everybody else is doing the heroin or whatever they're doing. That person is responsible for administering the our camp. That's why it's not that scary. Yeah, I think Lieutenant Riley did a great job of uh, explaining it. So, absolutely a great idea. But is there a segment of the community where it creates a false sense of security that it's there as a as a safety net for you? Probably so. It doesn't override the the benefits of it, but that, that's certainly, unfortunately, probably a byproduct of it as well. Okay. Because, there, because you guys have patients you've had to administer multiple times in a day. We are. We're we're, we're now carrying two different doses be, because of that. Uh, we're carrying a small 0.4 and a two milligram syringe because of the strength. And a lot of our primary are choosing to go right to the two milligrams. Um, and you know, time will tell, but I have a concern with places like you and I for young people that are going to feel a false sense, and that, that safety net may encourage use. Um, also, because of the rapid removal of that opioid off that brain receptor site, the withdrawal symptoms are quite dramatic, and usually people medicate. So we're going to see more polypharmacy. You know, we're going to see more benzos and more alcohol. That sedative to take that edge off that withdrawal symptom, or to go back into that opioid to, to knock off the withdrawal symptoms because people waking up from Narcan is not common. You know, oftentimes they're agitated, confused, aggressive. They, they're not happy. So it's, there's a concern. And if I if I could, Lisa, yes, uh, yes. I've also uh, partnered with uh, Drug Redo Ball, and I uh, oversee. I, I co-chair the Northeast Florida Opioid and Heroin Task Force. I mean, the education committee. Mm -hmm. And, and our ever-ending quest to bring awareness and education to this epidemic, folks, uh, we actually go out to workplaces, we go to agencies, and we hold uh, training classes. And if anybody here is interested in that, we could also get you um, uh, signed up for that. Uh, to date, and we just started this in October of last year, we have reached over 3,000 people uh, to give training on signs of opioid uh, abuse, uh, signs and symptoms, safe storage and disposal of opioids, which is a big one too, because what we find is, and a lot of people, you guys have probably read this in the in newspapers and seen it on the news, uh, a lot of these young kids are getting started with the opioids simply by going into a medicine cabinet and getting uh, prescription pills that haven't been used. And we also do training in the use of naloxone and Narcan and some of the things that the tenant talked about, uh, we cover that as well. So it's been good for us. In projects save lives, uh, persons who leave the ED, um, is technically they're discharged from the ED and then they're asked to go into treatment. Uh, whatever their decision is, they are given Narcan, nasal Narcan, the same as you can now get at Walgreens for free. We also would give it to their family and friends. So if somebody goes to the ED, no questions asked, they're your friend, we're discharging them and they say, heck no, I, I, I just want to get out of here. Would you at least let us give you this free Narcan? Mm -hmm. So, uh, to, to show you that we are a I mean, we're, we're definitely pushing it. And I read uh, the Project Save Life, the last um, update yes. to it, and it, there are 12% of these overdoses occur in zip code 32210 on the west side. So is there any special attention being paid um, to lowering the impact of the crisis in that area? Sure, we have tactical narcotics squads assigned to different areas of town, and we do have one assigned to the area that you're talking about. It's the area on the west side that is kind of between 103rd Street and Normandy Boulevard. That's where most of 32210 is. And uh, so, you know, they do targeted enforcement in that geographic area. But that's not enough. So you have supplies coming in from different areas. So we layer that with mid-level and uh, big deal, which is what we call our practical level to bring stuff into the city. We have squads that each do that work as well to try to get the supplies as they come into those local dealers in that area. So you have to layer the enforcement approach to really have an effect. But 
you know, again, looking at the report, we see that this is occurring all over Duval County. So it's not that it's happening only on the west side. It's not happening only on the northwest side. It is happening all over Duval County, um, as we're talking about with UNF. I mean, who would have thought that students at UNF were having these not hand parties? Um, so when we look at 32210 and we look at the west side and we think of it as being an area that is uh, mostly white, according to the statistics, uh, last year, 84% of the overdoses in Jacksonville occurred among white residents. Normally, when we think about drugs and drug overdoses and drug users, people automatically think about black folk. Um, many argue that the race distinction is part of the reason why this epidemic is now called a crisis. Whereas in the 80s, when there was this crack epidemic, it was those people and their criminals. Whereas now we're seeing people who are predominantly white taking opioids and now it's a crisis. So um, from a legal standpoint, how are the folks being treated differently now who um, have opiate addiction as opposed to those who are cracking heroin in the 80s? Well, it's a crisis now because it's killing people. That's what it is nationwide. It's not just here in the world. Kind of, demographics are pretty much the same throughout the United States. Uh, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, pretty much mirror what we're seeing here. But again, it's a crisis because people are dying. Uh, we have 43,000 people in 2016. Uh, 464 people was in 2016 in the Duval County. So the focus is on the opioids and opiates because people are dying. And we're targeting those, uh, like what they mentioned, targeting the, uh, the distribution, bringing the, the drugs into our city. And they were also targeting those dealers responsible for the overdose of deaths. And it's, it's tough. You got to work the case backwards from a victim who overdose and died. And then you got to trace it back through cell phones, through witnesses, through family members. And it can be done. And we, we've done that. We've proved that so far. We're going to say so. Uh, but it's tough, and it, it is a crisis. And it's not, and it's different from the crack, the powder cocaine, uh, the everything. I started at Fall Force 83, so I've seen it all. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this. Nothing comes close to this. And this is a crisis. I cannot speak to any racial disparity, but um, what I, our data shows is that addiction is not discriminatory. It crosses class. And as you speak to a possibility of a stigma with the 80s cocaine, there is a stigma with opioid addiction. And anybody who's ever experienced addiction or has a friend or family of addiction knows what I'm talking about. And we're still seeing that stigma here um, you know, with, within our program and our treatment. Uh, with, uh, I'm going to even say within our own personnel. Within, and I'm also a ER nurse. And, you know, there's stigma there, so there, there's a lot, but I have to check myself, you know, and uh, and I'm not immune to that. Nope, I don't think anyone is immune to that stigma. Um, and I, and I, you know, I know there was stigma in the 80s, and I, I still think it's moved forward here just with a different substance. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Mark, as Mark mentioned, the stigma, I met with uh, the Spartan Citrus County and all that, and they had a serious problem when I first mentioned here in the uh, all County. But the thing he pointed out was you have to overcome that stigma because uh, that's associated with opioid with opioid addiction. I get to overcome that. And that's through education, through treatment, through panels like this in the community. Uh, I know people who've been affected by it. A good friend of mine in Copa South Florida is settled with those who died. Uh, that overcome that stigma. It can happen to anybody. My second month here in my position at State Party's office, we were doing a case. And the, the victim was uh, 24, and somebody coached in basketball years ago, lost track of So it can happen to anybody, any family, my family, your family. Uh, so the stigma, get rid of the stigma of that open door, you know, it's, it's out there, and it will affect everybody. And that has an effect on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And speaking of uh, a lot of people, an alarming 54% of last year's overdoses in Jacksonville occurred among individuals who were between the ages of 25 and 39 years old. What can we do as just Joe Q citizen uh, to help solve, I guess we can't solve the crisis, but how can we help alleviate it a little bit among our young adults? 
I mean, this is huge. 54% between the ages of 25 and 39, when people are like usually in the prime of life, uh, they overdose in Jacksonville. What can we do? One of the number one things that I harp on is awareness and education. Uh, it is at the forefront of what we need to do. Uh, we have to understand that addiction is not a moral failure. Uh, moms seem to think if their, if their child is addicted that uh, they fail. You know, I, I raised five kids, one of them gone, I failed. So we've got to overcome that stigma and we like to overcome the, the, the stigma of the addict. Uh, the addict sits next to you in a cube. The addict is in your church. The addict is everywhere you go. A lot of times when I'll have a group therapy, I go to AA or NA, that room is comprised of all ages, colors, race, sizes, you got it. And these are places, and I always tell the guys, we probably would have never crossed paths if it wasn't for our addiction. And, and the running joke is, you know, crack, bringing people together. Uh, alcohol, bringing people together. Uh, so awareness and education and breaking down that stigma. It is amazing. Today, folks, I may go talk to somebody and tell them what I've been through. And, you know, it's it's one of the common things to say. And I guess it's the right thing to say. Is that you don't look like an addict. Well, I'm an addict. Trust me. And what does an addict look like? Everybody in this room. So when people like Prince or this or that, uh, when we find out that those people are addicts, nothing surprises me. Nothing. It could be one of these guys in blue, one of these guys in white, doctors, lawyers. It does not surprise me because I've sat in rooms with them for years hearing their story. I think Mr. Preston makes a great point. <clears throat> prevention and education is the most important piece here because you know an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. Trust me, once you get to the point where somebody needs help. But that safety net is needed. So as I travel to a number of forums, and many of us go to a lot of the same forums, the one thing you'll hear from folks is the lack of availability for treatment um, and, uh, and aftercare for those that do have an addiction or they have a family member with an addiction. So that's why I'm so encouraged by the Project Safe Lives that Lieutenant Riley's been talking about. Yeah, we have a pilot program here in this town that's trying to make a difference there. I mean, a pilot is that, you know, and it, it, if it's successful, we'll, be, we'll learn how to capitalize on those successes. <coughs> There's already discussion about that, but without appropriate treatment avenues for people that, that the prevention didn't work for, then we're going to have a problem. Law enforcement is, you know, I'm not trying to take a back seat on this. We have a role as well. But prevention and, edu and, and education and that treatment piece are the most important pieces of this puzzle. Um, and then we have to do our part in strategically working to keep, keep this stuff to a minimum. But if there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. That's just basic economics. But uh, prevention and education and then treatment options for folks that do have a problem. And that seems to be the biggest failure right now, whether it's mental health or substance abuse treatment. There is not many options for people in the community. Mm -hmm. Something um, I encourage us all to remember that uh, this evolved over time, and there is, in my personal opinion, there's not one finger to point at one individual or one agency or entity. This is not blame the doctors for writing scripts or blame law enforcement or blame legislature or, um, or, or but if you look at, uh, everybody has a role. So if we look at, say, uh, uh, cracking down on the pill mills, you know, there was an impact. Um, if you look at joint commission, hospital standards, uh, pushing pain relief. And when I say pushing pain relief, I'm, I mean literally document the pain scale and tie it back to reimbursement. Patient satisfaction service, tie it back to reimbursement. So we have a lot of physicians and providers, and, and you know, front row can speak to it, that were basically forced, or and forced to, to medicate um, patients versus helping them manage. And um, a lot of that is changing. It's all changing. The American Medical, Medical Society has dropped the pain scales. Uh, Joint Commission, which basically credits hospitals, dropped the pain scale requirements. Um, they dropped it out of the survey. So we're moving in a very positive direction to, to uh, I would say, empower providers and physicians mm -hmm. to better manage, to explain to the patients that pain is, is going to be appropriate. You know, it's, it, you're going to have it. You know, mm -hmm. um, that, that zero to pain scale is probably not achievable. 
and, um, and there's risks with it. Uh, Drug Free Duval does a great job working with youth. Um, I took an opportunity uh, mentoring a, a young man uh, this weekend who's um, trying pot and uh, fortune deal. And we kind of we had a little game. We were going somewhere. I said, well, you're going to, before we do this, I need you to spend 10 minutes with me. We're going to talk about marijuana. And I told him about you know, marijuana being laced with them or spray, fake weed, weed, spice. I scared him intentionally. I told him the truth, and I just told him the dangers involved with that, and uh, and this goes back to the awareness, the education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard, what's it like? Uh, what's the road to sobriety like? What is it like for a person who has to fight this and, and move towards sobriety? Uh, obviously, we know the rate of uh, recidivism uh, in addiction is, is horrible. Uh, when I was uh, at my last stop, they told me only. Five percent of you guys would make it, and typically it's about three mm-hmm. percent. And uh, I told them, you know, come hell or high water, I'm going to be in that five percent. But Lieutenant said something earlier. Just like all of us are individuals, everybody's road to recovery is a little different. Of course, there's a traditional twelve-step program, spiritual programs. But what I've come to find, Lisa, is this is an entirely new animal. Uh, we have great doctors uh, from the VA, we have Dr. Swan over there, uh, where we have to uh, maintain uh, uh, some of these people to keep from killing themselves, or they'll never get off this, uh, with substitution, suboxone, and, and different things of that nature. Um, I, when I was coming up uh, in my addiction, some of the people in the treatment facility were getting methadone. And we sort of look down on it, you know, say negative things. But my, my thinking has changed on that. And I understand the importance of it because this is death we're talking about. Um, it's amazing. I, I was uh, listening to uh, someone on TV the other day, and they were weighing marijuana and opioids. And this guy was one of the most staunch conservatives who said he would never relent on marijuana and stuff. He says, you know, I'm down with it because there has never been in the history of the world, according to him, a death associated with marijuana use, uh, which blew my mind. But I brought this picture to show people, this is what addiction will get you to, and this is me 12 years ago. Um, Kudos to him for talking to that young man before you get to the point of being addicted, Lisa. Because once you get addicted, that talk is no good. Um, so kudos to you. Good job. I mean, and then you're just uh, really reinforcing what Tim said. Because no one's ever seen anything like this before. So this is unlike any other drug addiction that we've seen before. Um, and kudos to all of you uh, for the role that you play in helping to educate the public. Uh, for helping the public, helping uh, those people who are not only the ads, but the people who are around them. We have a few minutes and we'll take some questions from the audience if you have any. May I add something first? Sure, of course. We'll take questions because we talked about the age demographic, which is an important thing. Yes. And uh, at least in the, in the fatalities that, that we have seen. Yes. Um, there's a fairly small number amongst the really young uh, users. And then in the group that you referred to, but uh, 25 to 35 mm-hmm. is a, a, a pretty big chunk of our cases, but then there's a very substantial amount that is actually old, older than that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the first six months of 2017, uh, people 35 to 50, there were 54 fatalities, wow. compared to 42 for the, for the younger group, and over 50 there were 32 fatalities. Um, I don't really know what to make about that, except um, you know maybe heroin addicts are, are, are living longer, or people are switching from pharmaceuticals to heroin. Or I, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just a very substantial proportion of the deaths is really in, a, in an older uh, patient population that we see. I would, you know, I actually have a theory on this, which is difficult to test, but. You know, those, those users that have been using for many years kind of had their dosing down to a, to a, a science, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And they knew what they could, they could handle. But this fentanyl, the increase of fentanyl we've seen, 
is what yeah. was hard for them to anticipate what that was going to do to that normal dose that they took. Yeah. And that dose that was a normal dose that they may have normally took was now a fatal dose because it had such a higher percentage of fentanyl as opposed to the, the heroin. And we have a, a doctor. And yes, I don't want to. I don't want to insert myself onto the panel, but uh, <laughs> you invited me, so thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Mike Sorna. I am a uh, quadruple boarded uh, addiction, psychi addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine a physician. I am chief of medication assisted treatments for substance use disorders for North Florida, South Florida Department of Veterans Affairs. <coughs> but I'll watch it because I heard you on NPR. So, a good penetrance. Uh, uh, just a comment, I appreciate everybody that came here, but I am struck since I hear this on NPR almost every day driving into work, which is great for my job security and for everybody who's up here's job security, not so great for our population, but uh, we have like well, 15 or 20 people that showed up here, so thank you for, for being engaged with this problem. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, to answer your question about what makes this different than the 80s, um, the, the medical director for the Centers for Disease Control came out last month and made a statement, and it's a pretty big one. The statement was, we are poised to lose an entire generation of Americans to this epidemic. This is not the 80s. This is in, since 2012, if, uh, accidental overdose deaths, all causes, have exceeded automobile accidents. Automobiles were number one up until, you know, since the invention of the Model T, until 2012. Now it's this. That's different. That's very different. And we are poised, not my quote, the big epidemiological expert, to lose an entire generation of Americans. This is serious business. Prevention, I love prevention. It's definitely an important part of this problem. And that is the future. Okay, so in medicine, we talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention strategies. So primary prevention is to prevent people from developing this disorder in the first place. And that's an important part of the problem, but it's not going to save that generation of Americans that have the disease. Those interventions are secondary and tertiary interventions, and going on and educating folks is not going to change those outcomes. Guaranteed. We know that to be true. The war on drugs, just say no, dismal failure. All right? Okay. So, but... Thoughtful, how we prescribe opioids, how do we train people about the risk that is important for the next generation of future at risk people, in particular people who can carry that genetic liability, I'll stand up to uh, uh, genetic liability uh, of this illness. And so, uh, so uh, secondary and tertiary prevention is where I come in in medication assisted treatments. And so, this disease is different. So, thank you for bringing that up compared to the other addictive disorders that we deal with. Um, and we're gonna, I'm also going to soften the language. We don't use the word addiction as much, although I, I happen to be an alcoholic, I'm being an addict. Um, however, a lot of our patients recoil with that, so we call it substance use disorders. This is a disease process, and if you look at actually the epidemiology of the nation, the way the disease spread, it spread through uh, Ohio River Basin, I mean Ohio uh, Valley Basin kind of area, and it spread through the southeast and then spread west. Um, and so it spreads just like you know, uh, bird flu, if it was going to come through and wipe out our population. It spreads like a disease because it is a disease. Okay, so it behaves like other diseases that we monitor, the CDC monitors. So uh, I, I like the idea of, of substance use disorder patients. You know, these are patients that are struggling with a medical illness um, that responds. Now, what's different in this epidemic compared to the other substance use epidemics, which I don't want to lose sight of because those are important too. Alcohol and tobacco still are going to kill a lot more people than this even does. But um, this is still, this is different because in those disease processes, we tend to say, hey, um, abstinence-based therapy, go work a program for recovery, get treatment, 12 steps, I love 12 steps, save my life, okay? But, but 12 steps doesn't work well for this. So DOD and VA, we are ones that came up with clinical practice guidelines regarding the treatment of these disorders, looking at the epidemiologic data in partnership with the CDC, in partnership with our very large organizations, including you know, so the VA and DOE are the single big healthcare providers in the United States. And, and what we've discovered is, is there's really two state-of-the-art gold standard treatments for opioid use disorder. Those two treatments are methadone and buprenorphine. Okay. You know, I do not recommend abstinence. If you want to do abstinence, there's a good reason for it. I'll work with you because it's patient choice, right? However, the standard of care is substitution therapy. Okay. 
There's a, there's a close third that's going to move up to equivalency with buprenorphine if evidence emerges, and that's Divitrol. Divitrol is an open blocking drug, so it's not a substitution therapy. Outcomes are excellent with that also. The problem is it's very expensive, it's hard to get people on it. So you're going to see, but it's still a medication assisted treatment. So every single person that comes into the Department of Veterans Affairs who suffers with this disorder is going to be offered at one of those standard of care treatments. And if they go, I really want to just kind of stop on my own, <coughs> I go, okay, but here's the risk. And the risk is overdose death. Um, the other thing I want to bring your attention to is the DEA uh, just testified uh, to Congress in February um, regarding the fentanyl uh, emergence. Um, this epidemic is interesting in, in many ways. First of all, we're going to see a shifting of demographic because of the cocaine. You're going to see more African Americans dying from this illness pretty soon and pretty fast, which is alarming because that population previously seemed to be relatively protected. That protection is no longer there. Um, that's just true for other uh, for other demographics that are currently being represented. This disease will spread to other demographics. I guarantee it. Okay. The other issue is going to be uh, is what people think they're doing. Right now, I don't know what the numbers are, maybe our colleagues can answer this, but I know what, what the DEA testified to Congress about in February is that there's a huge emergence of counterfeit oxycodone, hydrocodone, Xanax, okay? I got people who have overdosed thinking they were getting Xanax, they look just like two milligrams any bars, and they're fentanyl, okay? Because what's happening is as, as the medical profession has gotten better about now, not prescribing these medications, it's not palatable to the um, drug user to go to powder heroin, okay? Because I don't do heroin. They draw an intellectual boundary. I do oxycodone, except it's no longer oxycodone. It's a, they got pill presses, they can make the pills. It's hard for a pharmacist, they can't tell the difference. The only way they can tell the difference is send it to a lab and find out it's better. So here's what I say, I'll tell everybody. I don't borrow medicine from anyone. I don't care who I think you are, okay, or how, what your status in the community. I don't go borrow a from okay, because a lot of the prescription pills out there are <coughs> probably fentanyl. And here's the other thing that people do: they don't store their stash of their uh, oxycodone or supposed oxycodone tablets in an oxycodone bottle. They empty out the Tylenol bottle and they pour their pills in there. And then you go and say, hey, can I borrow a problem? And I forget what they have in that bottle, and you're about to have an overdose. Okay? So I control access to my medications. I would encourage you to do the same. It's trace elements of carfentanil and butarfentanil and um, butarfentanil are all in the community. Yes, you have that data. Um, these are more potent than naloxone. Naloxone will reverse their point four nasal. I guarantee you, you won't wake up. Okay? Because we're going to have to use two milligrams, and we're glad to hear you're doing that, and even higher in the ER. So you may not get rescued, and you may not even go to, you may, may assume it's not an opioid overdose because it took a Xanax, what they thought was a Xanax, and it's actually an opioid overdose. So this is a problem, and we need to, that's, we do need to educate people on this. Because really, like my kids, you know, they're not <coughs> community, and they go to their friends and say, hey, I got a headache, can you give me something? It could be the last time I ever took. So be safe. It really is that dangerous out there. Agreed? Does anybody disagree with any of that statement? <laughs> All right. I'm serious. It's like playing, playing Russian roulette. Just a few grains, but a carfentanil overdose is a grain of sand. That's how small it is. So if, even if that powder is in the pill container and it gets on the pill that you get, it may be enough to get you because the people like my son or my daughter or me, I'm opioid naive. So it takes much less just a small dose of somebody else's bad decision making, and it's the end of my life. And so, uh, it sounds gloom and doom, because it's pretty gloom and doom. You know, when we have the CDC saying, a generation of Americans, that's the fundamental difference. And it's gonna require partnerships of everybody that's up here, and everybody that's in this room, and yes, what can you do? Well, last year, estimated, $220 billion in lost revenues, estimated cost of loss of life, and all of the rescue law enforcement services, medical services that have to go to address 
the tertiary prevention of the person's overdose to make them die. Not the overall club. And so when our representatives in government say, hey, we're going to give $10 million to the state of Florida to solve this problem, um, the cost is billions. We're talking millions. And so if we, we really need to talk to the people that control these purse strings as a community and say, you know, yes, it's great that we all want to participate and we all give a lot of time about our own time to advocate, but we do need material money in order to attack the problem in a meaningful way. And how that's going to save lives is, is making sure that the evidence-based treatments are available. And that's Project Save Lives, awesome project. I'm not affiliated. I hope to be affiliated in the second uh, portion of this. But the key is, is getting them access to that evidence-based interventions, in particular MAT, so we can get those people on track, save the people that are already in trouble, and hopefully prevent the next cycle. That's my editorial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Um, and uh, to sort of springboard on what you said, Project Save, Save Lives has, is going in the right direction. Absolutely. They are seeing a decrease uh, in folks who are overdosing. Uh, there's a decrease in the recidivism that you talked about, uh, yes. too, Richard. I mean, it's a wonderful project that's going in the right direction. And hopefully, uh, as it continues, we'll see it replicated. We around will, the country. Uh, next week, City Council will vote on the extension of Project Save Lives for the same dollar amount. We're under budget, which is a good thing. Uh, in government, wow. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and so we're looking at extending, extending it, and uh, for the 32210, we're reaching out to Park West, which is right there on 103rd, and I'm trying to bring the project there and to Memorial on the south side. Make sure your representatives are aware that that project is important and that we, as taxpayers, are willing to fund these sorts of projects. We can't shoulder all of the burden, but you know, if you're here, I suspect you might be interested in saying, hey, I'm willing to have some of my tax dollars go to do that. Oh, and one other thing about the prescription medications. Uh, we know this from uh, large-scale surveys of the United States. We have a very good idea of where people get their prescription tablets illicitly. Has anybody guessed where they get it most often? Friends and family, 80% of the time. So this is what I mean, you can't tell. So, oh, I borrowed some oxycodone from my dad who couldn't get enough from his doctor and bought some from someone who got it from the drug dealer and it's actually fentanyl, right? So that's how it gets out there. This is why you can't buffer yourself. Well, I'm not going down, on, I'm not going out to Normandy Boulevard and going down to the guy that's sitting on the corner. I'm getting it from, you know, a friend that I trust. Oh, Good luck with that, because what we know is 85%, that's how it's getting the folks, and, and it really is dangerous. And so, you know, get your doctor, get your medications from your doctor, <laughs> take them as prescribed, uh, don't get them from friends and family, and teach your, teach the people you love about this, about the risk of it. So prior to tonight's program, did everyone in the audience know that you could be affected by the dust? <laughs> of this medication like did not know until you shared that with us so it is unlike anything we've seen do we have any questions from the audience for the panel yes sir i've been in pharmacy for 23 years my doctor for the last 10 years and you know um obviously put on you know prescriptions down the airport 100 and you know kind of went up 100 so all we did was they should really ship these people out um, I've also been clean so for 27 years. So, very much to suicide, and you know, I thought I'd have to do go for the at 16. But what I'm currently doing right now is I'm opening a pharmacy. Um, we work with the youth in New Oxnard, which is like an 875 or one You know, during 9 to 12 months and 18 months. 25% of the cost of the retail level. A lot of these factors, you know, Suboxone, are just, they say they find they don't really want you. What happens, I find, is they just, you get them one and you just keep it off. And I'm, you know, I'm fair, I, I cut my teeth on 12 steps, right? I still got to see on it, you know, and, but this is a whole new creature. There's stuff that's out there. And if we don't recognize, we have to do some sort of thing. And, and, and duration of treatment, you know, the recommendation duration of treatment for substitution therapy is indefinite. 
Yeah. So we don't say, oh, we're going to try to get you off as soon as possible. Right? That's not the same. But what's happened, I think, is people are on it for 10 years, and they're like, no, they're not. They are. You know, it's a box on the top. It's, it's, it's going to continue. So, you know, on that point, I really appreciate what we're doing. I think we're going to put that new work in. And it's very expensive. It is. And it's not readily available. It's $20, $20 a day, $1,200 a month, $40,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else who's in with a relative? That's branded. What's, what's the generic cost? There is no generic stock. That's not true. That's all I have. Are there strips? No, on the strips, but there's generic something with that one. Uh, that's all I have. Yes. Yeah. Who's in with a relative? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
down at a gateway, and you know, just in the time of filling out paperwork, they say, I'm gonna go out and take a cigarette, and you never see them again. So the availability of those beds, and, and like Dr. Sonner said, these are things we can talk to our representatives, the people we vote for, the people that run our city. We need we need money for that. I don't know how we get it. I'm not into politics, but it's definitely a need. If anybody in here knows a veteran uh, that is struggling with this illness, I can give my personal assurance that if they're eligible for care at the Department of Veterans Affairs, they will have access to all the standard of care treatments that I've discussed at low or no cost to the veteran. So I can't comment for the rest of the population, but that's our contribution to that population. This is a large veteran city. And so um, we are happy to treat those people. Just be aware that not all, all people who are veterans are eligible for care, but we will sort that out. And we're gonna partner with uh, uh, Project Safe Lives to figure out how do we, if we cannot provide ongoing care, can we get <coughs> ongoing care in return? I may find a veteran that's eligible. We're gonna take them on board and make sure they get the care that they need. Uh, well, first of all, care is not affordable for these loved ones. I have a loved one who's over those three times. This is my question. Are lawmakers looking at, you call 911, they give them Narcan, two doses of it, take them to the hospital. When they get better, they walk out. Nobody keeps them there. They don't get treatment. Or you send them to rehab, they get clean, they come out, they overdose because they're not used to it anymore. What can you do to, I'm going through the marching act right now. It's just, it is not working. <laughs> it is not working because you have the burden to prove that they are addicted. And you can't bring medical records in there. I just had it here last week. I don't know if my son showed up. It's my son, and I wish he wouldn't be taking this leave. <laughs> I really don't want him to It is my son, my 29 year old son. Thank you for being here. That's right. But what you're asking for is exactly what the pilot is trying to establish and then try to take it out further. But, uh, and, and I'm going to address the Marshman Act. So, so within the Marshman Act, I believe it's Florida Statute 394. So two things uh, that are important on there. Um, within the Marshman Act, most people think of the Marshman Act similar to a Baker Act, which is more for mental health, where there are risks to themselves or others. The Marshman Act is for substance misuse. And... Uh, most people think of the Marshman Act as the family's got to get involved and petition to the court. You know, usually two or three of these families got to petition to a judge. It's a several day process, and that's not the quickest. And the whole time, your, your son or loved one is out there using. Uh, so within the Marshman Act, there's a physician certification, and that is where Project Save Lives is working with the ED doc, primarily Dr. Gilberstein, the same Vincent's, and we're, and to, educate ED physicians, teach themselves, they're having to learn this right now, what authority do physicians have? And there is the ability for an ED physician, physician period, not just the ER physician, and Dr. Schoner can do it, um, to, to basically certify an individual for and put them into involuntary emergency treatment and detox. Mm -hmm. It's called a physician certification. It is not used often. Physicians simply don't know. So we are working with Project Save Lives to uh, get a subject matter expert, attorney, to let these physicians know what can they do. Um, and that would eliminate the need for the family to get immediately involved. So now it still has to be followed up by court several days later. There's a time frame, uh, I believe it's 48 hours. So you gotta get something to the court to keep them. Well, basically it buys time. I'm not an addict. In knowing people who are who suffer from opioid substance use disorder, what I hear is those withdrawal symptoms. They don't want to go through that pain, particularly like those uh, get, like getting on Vivitrol. You got to be clean for uh, you know, seven or ten days, so they don't want to go through that. And what we're trying to do is bring compassionate care to the ED. Wherever your son is picked up, wherever he's transported to, is to educate that ED about compassionate care to get those uh, mu those uh, muscle relaxers, those uh, alpha blockers on board to decrease those withdrawal symptoms, to satiate his brain so that he can sit there. You have to have him back to his house. Yeah. <laughs> you gave him medication which helped that, but then you went right back to it. Yes, ma'am. And ma'am, uh, speaking as an addict of substance use disorder guy, 
Uh, I was marginalized by my family. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer on this one, but we all have to remember we're not thinking rationally. <coughs> one of the things that keeps us in our addictions are resentments. And I hated my family for what they did to me. And it became a big, why are you doing this to me? You know, and, and I'm not saying it doesn't work for everyone uh, because everyone can tell you, Dr. Sorner, everybody up here, there's all different aspects of keeping people in addiction with enabling being way up there at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have enabling, uh, we have resentments, uh, we have, uh, you just don't know. You mix all that up and you've got a formula that is just out of control and crazy. Um, I've uh, gone to the Marchman Act with a couple of people and then I'm going to end with this. Self-responsibility is very high when it comes to breaking this cycle. Um, I don't know too much about the physical addiction part and all that. I never went through that. But the one thing I do know is you got to surrender. That's old school. And say, I'm done. I won't help. Whatever you guys tell me, I'm going to do. And um, I just want to say, and God bless you. And like you said, thank you for being here. You're the most important person in the room. <laughs> My experience is helpful to you to be. Um, uh, I work in the field. We talk a lot about compassion fatigue. It's, it's fatiguing. You know, we have uh, many patients that do very well. We have patients that have uh, bad outcomes, uh, including death. And, um, unfortunately, it does take a buy in by the individual ultimately, even to engage in these medical treatments. But what I can say to you as a person that works with uh, patients who struggle with this illness all day, every day, is that I have had patients that I thought weren't going to make it, had multiple relapses, multiple times, but we just keep trying, we keep trying, we keep trying, and then one day it works. And you hope you beat them, you know, in regards to, uh, you know, getting before the bad outcome happens. So I do see that, you know, despite how many failures you may face, there is hope. Uh, and I see people every day to stay in that boat. Um, I pray for, for you and your family. Um, keep trying. You might consider um, to help you and other people who are struggling with the act of illness. Al-Anon can be a great support. And so uh, to help, I know I can do it. My mother's still an active addict. And so I find al to be a great relief for me because I try to practice addiction medicine out there. It doesn't work well. <laughs> so, you know, I have to take care of myself and how my relationship to her illness works inside of me and how that jeopardizes me. Because you can't be there if you can have compassion fatigue and you're not taking care of yourself. So my prayers with you and there is always hope. Yeah. And I'd like to connect with you if you're up to possibly have a recovery career specialist, somebody who if you would be open to uh, possibly uh, allow me to connect your son with a recovery career specialist, somebody who I don't is even know where my son is right now. I will give you a phone number and a cell phone number of the uh, somebody at Gateway Question, thank you. So it is not over the counter. It is the laws change to allow pharmacists to prescribe it with, without you walking in with your own prescription. So it is still recorded your name, turning your driver's license, just uh, similar to picking up really a say even Sudafed. Right. It's kept behind uh, there, and it's and so yes, literally you can walk into Walgreens as an adult and simply say I want some nasal Narcan, and they're going to give you a form to fill out. And uh, probably within you know five minutes, it's going to show up at about thirty six or forty dollars, and then they zero out. This is Walgreens, and, and, and I'm not plugging Walgreens, but I'm quite impressed. Mm -hmm. um, so who's I went, funding that? Do you, do you know, is it the so I, I do not know. Uh, I don't know if it's a product with Adapt Pharma, and I say that because Adapt Pharma is a producer of nasal Narcan, and I know they work with Rutgers Ball. 
um, on and also with Project Save Lives. As far as um, and I know that we also have monies from the state, and from services funding that. Um, but so, uh, how many times you can give it? As many times as the symptoms are there, or somebody's unresponsive and or shallow or not breathing. So there's there's no endpoint, um, and it is sick. Um, there are side effects if somebody is on an opioid and it reverses. Oftentimes, the person may experience uh, a, a sudden abrupt awakening. They may vomit. They may have uh, shakes or seizure-like activity, uh, similar to withdrawal symptoms. And it may take them several minutes, similar to coming out of a seizure, to be acclimated and understand what's going on. Um, but as long as the, the victim is unresponsive, not breathing, no oxygen is indicated. And, and, it, and the pack you can get at Walgreens tonight, it's eight milligrams. It's a four milligram nasal spray and uh, two pack. So similar to an EpiPen, you always have to carry two. So. So uh, just uh, recently, several months ago, I added nasal Narcan to our paramedics uh, reporting uh, software so that we can track it. And to date, we have three. Uh, uh, times where the paramedics have documented that nasal narcan was given prior to our arrival. So that lets me know it is out there in the community. Um, on average, we're giving about 250 doses of Narcan a month, our paramedics are. We've seen a sharp decrease actually over the past, since November, a very sharp decrease. Um, so last month we gave 182 doses of Narcan. In our community, uh, we have a national uh, effort to maximize naloxone prescribing uh, to veterans that are at risk for overdose. That doesn't really mean they have no opioid use disorder, but people on high doses uh, of opioids may uh, uh, have other conditions that increase their risk of overdose death and avert overdose death. And we have we thought about the concerns about some of these untoward uh, um, but our unintended consequences of use in regard to enabling continued behavior. But our data for, from us is pretty clear that it definitely saves lives. Um, it definitely extends the moment of the opportunity to potentially intervene. Uh, my, uh, this is policy of one addiction psychiatrist that I prescribe a lot of this medication. Um, and if they lose it or ask for another one, I'm happy to give them another gift. I don't ask a lot of questions because I think it's, uh, have another gift. This gentleman here. Do you guys do these types of forums in like the high schools and middle schools as far as prevention and you know the targeting and educating youth? Um, I mean, how early? Yeah, so uh, there's a, a drug free ball I'm aware of, uh, Mel, uh, Melanie that works with the school. She's basically the youth coordinator, and I I personally met a JSO officer that was also part of the program too to help educate the schools. Um, we, JFRD, have not gone into the schools. We need more fire safety within the schools at this point. Yeah, I have not participated in the forum in the schools themselves. <clears throat> but the, the school board has a police department too, so I can't speak exactly what they're doing. But I know, <coughs> like uh, Mark was saying, we do participate in drug free ball in their programs that are aimed at teens. I just don't know how many of those are actually in schools. Yeah. I know I got a 16 year old daughter, she's an addict, and she's at Webster High School, and you know, I'm an addict. And I know she inherited it from me. So uh, and I've seen firsthand her go through a few things, and I've already gotten a phone call from Jacksonville Beach Police to go pick her up because she was skipping school for two weeks. And I was just wondering, you know, you were talking about prevention and information, you know, being an ounce of knowledge is worth a ton of pure and whatnot. I mean, that might, I mean, the numbers you guys are spitting out today is informative. It's, and you know it's enlightening it's something that's grabbed my attention where before i was uneducated in, in a few areas now i am, am educated um a lot of high schoolers may or may not listen but those that do listen you know word spreads by word of mouth and it could possibly work or help yeah, make one, with another organization out there, if I sort of the Derek Hatcher Foundation, yes. uh, good group. Uh, Derek's mom is the one who's in the community, going to schools, uh, talking about the dangers of opioid abuse. Uh, Derek Hatcher, of course, died in overdose a few years ago. He's a football star uh, locally. Uh, uh, the heart's still aches, think about him. But you know, she's, she's turned a bad situation, trying to make a, a good out of that. She's trying to educate the community. Uh, 
If I could add something else uh, to that, there is a program through Drug Free New Ball, and it's called Expert Export. I'm not good with the acronym, so uh, I'll give you uh, my phone number <clears throat> before you leave, and I'll get you in touch. With you. I'll get more information about it. And it is uh, awareness for middle school. I think it starts in middle school, six through nine. We were just up in Tallahassee uh, a couple of months ago, and we talked to a lot of the representatives and the senators about that. And that bill did pass. So there's something going on with that. Uh, I don't want to give you any wrong information, but I guarantee you I will get you the information. And if I could see this young lady right here, uh, Cheryl, uh, I don't want to butcher her last name, uh, but she's on the front line too when he brings up Debbie Hatcher. Uh, she has a, a story I won't, uh, if she wants to share it, uh, that would be her. But uh, she's on the cutting edge of this too because of something that would, didn't have a great outcome. Yeah, I lost my husband about, it'll be almost nine months, a couple of weeks now. And um, we were voiceless for so long. So I feel like I need to be a voice for those that do not have one right now. And as you said, education is key. And that's what I can do is help raise awareness as to what, you know, the family and the picture of an addict actually looks like. And it's not typically what you think it might look like. And um, I, I wanted to make a comment because I think this report is phenomenal because I've been doing a lot of research. It, it's, and and I'm, it's alarming, especially knowing my husband is one of the numbers on here. Um, but is there any thoughts about putting something like this together for like the hospital? I mean, the medical, the state of Florida has, you, you mentioned that we were number two for deaths with fentanyl uh, next to West Palm Beach. And the medical examiner has a, a great report too, broken down. Is there any thoughts on doing something like this for the hospitals that are actually, obviously yes. they're transporting them to the hospital, but there's other There's people. difficulty with the hospitals. The hospitals do report through ACA, and also there is a, uh, like a repository, I'm, I was trying, trying to think of the name of the, the software, the program, and UF uh, Health is part of Project Save Lives. They're tapping into that resource, and we have um, a, a term called healthcare economist, basically that look at the impact of different ailments um, financially, and of course that, that garners the hospital's attention when you talk about economics. Um, the problem that we are seeing right now in coalescing and pulling the data from the hospitals are uh, billing codes here. ICD-10 codes, they're basically classification codes that the physician has to select based on the diagnosis. And um, oftentimes there are, I think it's 30,000 or something, ICD-10 codes. It recently upgraded about two years ago from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Anybody in healthcare understands the nightmare of picking an ICD-10 code. I mean, for substance uh, use, there may be several hundred. You gotta keep drilling down, drilling down uh, to whatever the substance is. And oftentimes, when the patient presents to the ED, they may be there for other ailments. They got in a car accident because they were using drugs. So they have a traumatic injury, which is ICD-10 code, to their ankle, the left ankle. They also have substance misuse. My point in that is uh, the data is very different. And there is no one standard, no one set of who's coding this, what this physician decides to code. This physician just decides, you know what, i got to get out of here. I'm clicking the first thing I see. The other position may take their time and drill down. We are addressing it about the Gilbert status, trying to work with providers. Our data from the hospitals are so skewed because of that. Yeah, I couldn't find really a lot of information online that was pretty particular because my research, when I'm gonna be speaking about this, I need to make sure that I've got the correct data. So I'm not speaking on that, but um, mm -hmm. from the medical examiner's office and the CDC, there's a lot of information, just not a lot in the hospitals. CDC's had points on this. Uh, this. This data that we know of is alarming. This is not uh, a rep, I, it, the whole amount. Uh, you ask anybody who uh, spends a lot of time, <coughs> they have no idea how actually big the problem is. Uh, but it's much bigger than this very scary data would indicate. Because if you end up um, being coded for death as respiratory failure, um, and with the medical examiner officers throughout the nation being overwhelmed and having their own cost constraints, we, we lose capture on a lot of things that were actually overdose deaths that we, we may not know. And so uh, it's, it's a bigger problem than even the data would exhibit, but the data is enough for us to act. It's kind of how I think about it. Would you agree with that statement, 
Carter? Yeah, I would. Is there anything that we left out of the conversation tonight that you would like to make sure that we all leave with? Uh, when we're getting out of here tonight, what do you want to resonate with us? And Tim, we'll start with you. Uh, the biggest piece is education, awareness in the community. We kind of all addressed it locally here tonight. Uh, overcoming the stigma of the addiction, because that really affects upper body. Um, we've all seen it. You know, overcoming the stigma and the community. Uh, we say it turns out that we know what we can't uh, prosecute our way out of the problem. We can play a small part in that, like a three-minute school prevention treatment enforcement. So, us and Dennis so, uh, we have the enforcement piece. We also play that role with the prevention and treatment, uh, with the coach of the ball, the gateway. So, it's a team effort that's got to come together to see uh, to solve this problem. I would say don't be afraid to talk to those that represent you at the state uh, <coughs> and federal level about the need to increase access to meaningful treatment for folks. As I travel um, and, and go to these forums, that's typically the number one topic that comes up. Um, folks that are willing to share is they have a loved one that they're having, even when they have that moment when they're ready for treatment, they don't have anywhere to go. And uh, that's, it's heartbreaking to hear that. I would say get involved. Uh, there's nothing too little that you can do. Um, passing out pamphlets, uh, helping um, the ladies at Drug Free You Law. Um, everybody else from the top doctor, Dr. Gilbrad, Dr. Palm, uh, medical examiner's office, uh, everybody is a vital cause in uh, helping this epidemic. I read to people yesterday and uh, the name was James and Amy Gandy, and they're out in the 103rd Street area, and their ministry is called Hands and Feet, because that's what they do. They're on their hands and feet, and they're in the, in the trenches with, with the people where they are trying to help them. So, uh, you know, as, as somebody said, it takes a village, and we need it. Uh, as I, I think Richard alluded to, uh, simply telling somebody who's suffering uh, deep in the deep in addiction or cocoa use substance use disorder, uh, saying no, saying stop it doesn't work. Uh, in that vein, uh, what I would encourage and ask is for anybody who is using drugs, don't do it alone. Um, not to encourage drug use, but don't do drugs alone. Give yourself an opportunity to live. Um, and uh, consider getting Narcan, letting uh, you know where the Narcan is in the house and wherever it is, but simply don't do drugs alone. Dr. Uh, <coughs> well, unfortunately, I see the end result of all this, but I, I think the, what I've learned about it is that, uh, first of all, it's a very dangerous time to be a drug addict or a, a recreational drug user, and that the margin of safety it's so small with these substances, it, it's just, it's much more dangerous uh, than using cocaine or using, you know, using alcohol or anything like that because it's so unpredictable. You don't know what you're buying, you don't know what you're getting, and um, I mean, you would see a tremendous like, increase throughout the whole state of Florida, actually. Um, and it's just, it's just too dangerous. Dr. Soren, our uh, sort of honorary panelist. Yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I'm excited that you guys are doing this. And, and you know, I, that's why I heard on the radio and diverted to, to over here. So um, I appreciate uh, this meeting. Uh, I would piggyback. I, I really think that this is a community based problem. So it's going to require community based solutions. Um, you know, the, in my, the addiction psychiatrist, you know, there's two of us in Jacksonville area, me and Ray Palm. So, you know, we're not going to be able to, to address directly all of the needs. And so we, we need uh, partners uh, in the community that are willing to give resources. We need the community to advocate um, for our community to our legislators to prioritize this as an emergency, as a public health emergency, as the president said, and, and do what you can. You know, think locally, act locally. And so, you know, I'll do my little piece of the pie where I can and, and show up to meetings where I can and spread the word. And when we prioritize it together, I'm confident we can find solutions. It's just going to require everyone's perspective and everyone's support because it's that big of a problem.
And the jet oh, sir. Uh, I was just going to say, my name is Dave Kirby. I work for uh, the court system. I'm the Veterans Treatment Court case manager. And if anybody knows of anyone that needs assistance in the justice system, come down to 2321 and you can check out their cases and try to see what they can do for Diversion courts highly effective. Yes, no. So um, we, those are awesome <coughs> resources. The Jacksonville Public Library uh, wants to thank our panelists, our, our subject matter experts, for being here tonight. Um, we want to thank all of you who came. Those of you who shared your stories, I think that uh, made it that mo much more impactful for, for us. Um, if you would, before you leave, please fill out a program evaluation so that we know what types of programs you would like to see in the future. Um, again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to all of you. And have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.